Praise the Lord. <laughs> glory, glory, glory. All right, you ready for me? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> Well, I, mean, I saw y'all looking like you were going to do something else. Thank <laughs> you. Lord bless us, you know. Hey, Lord. Hey, look, I, I know some of you guys, <clears throat> I don't know how close the camera has been uh, while I've made an announcement or two or something, but you're probably looking at this shirt. Um, I'm pretty casual today. You know, I usually dress up uh, a lot, dress here. <laughs> Than, than this, and uh, you know, at least don't have my tennis shoes on and a, and a, and a t-shirt. Uh, but this is a special t-shirt because this, is, this was given to us by one of our members last week, provided for our church and all of you guys that were here that wanted one. Now, we did uh, run out of them, and um, so he's ordered some others, so the, some more will be available if, you know, so that if any of you in here don't have one, uh, you can get one. And so just because I know that some of the people watching, if, if you know, you, you might be distracted by trying to figure out what this is, and it's just our Freedom River Church logo on the front, and then on the back, it has some writing and the logo, and it says, you don't have to go to Freedom River Church to go to heaven, but why take the chance? And so that's what's on the back, and the logo's also on the back, and uh, this is wonderful, and uh, so that's, that's what it is, so all right, you guys know, so you can relax, pay attention to what we're doing and, and what's going on. Um, I'm starting a, a brief series, uh, and I say that, you know, <laughs> kind of tongue-in-cheek, uh, on, on grace, on the grace of God. Uh, we're certainly living in a world now that is calling for the grace of God. Uh, certainly it is the grace of God that the world's not destroyed at this moment because of its wickedness and evil. And um, we, we really get to see humanity at its, uh, at its worst, um, which is pretty bad, uh, actually. And I know that there are a lot of people that think humans are good and so forth, but no, we're bad. We are born that way. Uh, for all have sinned, there's none righteous, no, not one, is what Romans 3.10 says. And then it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is why none of us are righteous. And, uh, and we just seem to have a bent and a pension to move toward more and more evil rather than to move toward good. And I know this is no surprise to you. And if you have children, it's certainly no surprise to you. Um, you can see just base humanity from the time we're born. Uh, it's just unbelievable uh, how we are. So the grace of God... and. And the reason that uh, uh, the grace of God is so vital is because it's so misunderstood. And there are many people that don't come to the Lord because they don't understand grace at all. Uh, many people on this earth, as a matter of fact, I would s say the majority of people on this earth really feel like that in order to come to God, you know, you have to become something. You, you, have to, you have to do better. You have to live better. You have to uh, deserve to be forgiven, so to speak. You have to earn some merit with God. And so you have to come to church, so that'll be some positive points for you. You have to read your Bible or do something or be nice to somebody or quit cursing or drinking or whatever it is that you consider to be wrong in life so that you can get some points and, and, and God can uh, give you a little bit of grace or mercy. Well, that's not how it works at all. If it did work like that, none of us would be saved because we're all wicked by nature and by birth and by choice. And none of us have done anything that's good enough to, to, to represent us to God as to having any value whatsoever. The only thing that gives us any relationship with God is his wonderful grace, which is, man, his tremendous basic characteristic that, that God wants us to know. First, let me just say this, that, that, that we need to kind of begin with understanding that, that there is a difference between Christianity and all other religions of the world. 
I mean, all of the other religions, and I know there are probably thousands of them. I mean, we know the big ones, the Buddhists, the Hindus, the Islam, we know the cults, and we know the satanic cults, and we know the occult, and we know, you know, we, we know lots of off-brands and off-breeds of different, you know, religious thoughts and so forth, but Christianity is the only belief system, and I'm using the word belief system on purpose rather than the word religion because Christianity is not a religion. A religion is men trying to work their way to God by some set of rules or some set of standards by which they attain some form of righteousness or some way of living. I know that's not the technical definition, and some people could argue, well, it is. Well, go ahead. But Christianity is God's Uh, reaching down to us through his son Christ to raise us. So it's Christianity is not about us doing things that make us better, rules and regulations and laws and so forth. What Christianity is about is about God doing something to reach down and to lift us up. And so Christianity is the only set of beliefs in the world that has the concept of a personal God that is gracious. No other, no other belief system in the world presents a personal God. Many of them, as a matter of fact, don't present any God. Uh, God could be anything, and he's not personal for sure. But Christianity says God is a personal, that he's involved with us personally, and his nature is gracious. And so we don't have a religion like everybody else's religion in the world, if you want to label it as that. The primary virtue of God, the, the, the virtue that God wants to be known for is his grace. And I'll show it to you in the Gospel of John in the first chapter. The first chapter of John, Gospel of John, starts in the beginning Uh, It starts before any of the other gospels and it tells us this about the creation and Jesus and God. It says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God and without him was not anything made that was made. And then skipping down to verse 14, he says this, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, and here's the line, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. So what John is saying is here is that we have beheld the glory of God as Jesus Christ has presented to us the glory of God. We, do, we know God's glory because Jesus presented to us the glory of God. And Jesus presents God's glory as being full of two things, full of grace and full of truth. So God's, God is, is full. It doesn't say he's half full of grace and he's half full of truth. No, he's full of truth and he's full of grace. So God is like double full, all right? And, and, and he's, he's full of grace and, and he's full of truth. But in connection with truth, I want you to notice that grace always comes first. I know if you're introducing yourself to someone and you want them to know what you consider to be maybe your greatest virtue or what you would like for them to know what, that you consider your greatest asset, you'll usually say that first. Like if I were to introduce myself to you and I would say, uh, hi, I'm Keith Thrash and I'm pastor of Freedom River Church. Well, the reason I would say I'm pastor of Freedom River Church after I introduce myself is because I would want you to know that I consider one of my greatest virtues is that I'm the pastor of a church and I would like for you to know that. Well, when, when God set, introduces himself always in the word, and you can check this out on any passage that, that gives you some, any of the attributes of God, his grace is always listed first. 
He says, the first thing I want to say about myself is I want you to know that I'm full of grace and I'm full of truth. So God says, this is what I want to be known for. I want to be known for the fact that I am a gracious God. And so anytime God's attributes are mentioned, grace always goes first, all right? Why does grace go before truth? Uh, I know that we're all interested in truth. We all know God is the truth. We know that that's a great asset. We know that he tells the truth and that he is the truth. So why does God always present himself as a gracious God before he presents himself as truth? I have three reasons for you, all right? Number one, grace encourages me to desire God. Uh, Without grace, God is not desirable. God's not even approachable without grace. I mean, think about it. He's pretty scary, right? I mean, a God who knows everything, a God who can do everything, a God who can be everywhere at the same time. I mean, there are lots of things God could do, right? And we would be afraid of God. Apart from grace, God is, is, is undesirable and unapproachable. And here's what Hebrews says about it. Hebrews 4, verse 14 Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Now, our confession of what? Uh, our confession that we do have a great high priest, right? <laughs> so because we have a high priest in heaven, let's hold fast to that confession that we do. And then he gives us the reason, verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So our God is a God of grace and his throne is a throne of grace. Many of you have heard my stories about how I was brought up and the fact that I was not brought up in church. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, nobody in my family was a Christian. Uh, I was the first Christian in our family, and I was 16 years old when I came to the Lord. So we didn't, we didn't have any Christian friends, and we didn't know really any Christians. But as I began to, uh, you know, as I began to grow from a child into teenagers, uh, I developed some friends, and some of those friends went to church. So sometimes I would be asked to go to church with some of my friends, and... Uh, and of course, a lot of times I would go. I didn't have anything against God. I, I mean, I, I believed in God and I believed in Jesus and all of that, but I, I didn't know anything about the Lord and I, I wasn't, a, wasn't a Christian. But I would go to church with them. And so I went to all kinds of churches. I went to Baptist churches, Methodist churches, Presbyterian churches, Pentecostal churches, you know, uh, spirit-filled churches. And I went to all kinds of churches. And I can remember one specific church and I, I must have been, you know, probably 14 years old, roughly, just a kid. And, um, and, I, and we went in the church and it was a, a fairly small church. It probably had 50 or 60 people in there. And so it was obvious that I was a visitor. I mean, you know, when you have 50 or 60 people, you, you can tell when somebody new is there. And I don't know whether the pastor felt like, okay, here's this new guy, he's a teenager. Um, I would say I had long hair, but I really didn't have long hair. <laughs> I mean, even though this was in the 60s, the late 60s, I, I tried to have long hair, but my hair was so bushy, you know, it just, it puffed out. It didn't really grow long. So I probably looked like, I don't even know what I looked like, but I thought I looked good, but I probably didn't. Uh, but anyway, oh, I did. Well, thank you, babe. You're so, that's my wife of 44 years. No bias there whatsoever. But anyway, um, so I, I, I'm assuming, I'm, and this is just my assumption now, I, I don't know it at all, but I'm assuming that when he saw me there, that he felt like he really needed to uh, tell me uh, everything that he felt like was important about uh, salvation and about what I needed to do and how people needed to live and so forth. So for 45 minutes, and I'm really not being critical, man, preachers, I love preachers, so I'm not trying to criticize preachers, but for 45 minutes, remember I'm a 14-year-old, don't know the Lord, not a Christian, and I'm sitting there trying to listen and evaluate what is this about and what's Jesus about and what's the kingdom about and blah, blah, what do I need to do and so forth. And for 45 minutes, he just yells about everything that, that you are not supposed to do. 
You're not supposed to, you know, we don't, we don't watch TV because TV's of the devil. We don't go to movies because movies of the, are, are of the devil. And we certainly don't listen to the devil's music and we don't dance to the devil's tune. I mean, he was just giving it down the country. And for 45 minutes, he was yelling all of these things that we don't do. And that makes us, I guess, good Christians. And so as I'm going out, I'm thinking and I'm riding home now and I'm trying to be totally honest about this now. And remember, don't judge me too bad because I was a teenager and I didn't know the Lord and I wasn't saved. And I'm just trying to evaluate what I had been hearing. And as we drove home with my, in my friend's car with their family, I'm thinking two things. I'm, I'm thinking, number one, is that the way God really is? Is what he said the way God really is? Is God, is God you know, some tyrant in heaven that's got this big long list of you don't do this and you don't do that and you don't do that and you don't run with those and you don't do that? And, and now being completely honest, my second thought was, if that's the way God is, I'm not sure I wanna go to heaven. I mean, honestly. And, and, and that's frightening, isn't it? It's, it's frightening to think that somebody would be thinking that, that Man, if that's the way God is, I think I'd rather go to hell than go to heaven because I, don't, I, don't, I certainly don't want to be, have anything to do with a God like that. Well, many people think that that's the way God is because that's the way uh, churches, uh, Christian people present God as being like that many times. And that's the way many churches preach and call that the gospel. <laughs> you know, I'm preaching the gospel. No, that's not the gospel. The gospel is, is not, hey, congratulations, you're going to hell. No, the gospel is you don't have to go to hell. That's the good news. The word gospel means good news. The good news is not that I'm so bad and so wicked. The good news is Jesus Christ loves me anyway. That's the gospel. But people get all wound up. And, and, and so God wants us to know that he is a God of grace. God is not mean. God is not cruel. God is not angry. As a matter of fact, the, word, the term mean Christian is an oxymoron. It's both words. If you're mean, you're not a Christian. If you're a Christian, you're not mean. I mean, it, that just doesn't compute with God because here's what Jesus says about us as Christians now. John 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Next verse, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, this is Jesus talking, remember, and he said, all of the people will know that you belong to me because you are full of love. Notice that he didn't say you're full of truth. He said, they will know that you belong to me because you are full of love. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not down on truth. You know this, I love truth, I preach the truth, I believe, I, I believe everything I, pre, I preach is the truth or I wouldn't be preaching it to you. So truth is absolutely vital and I'm not negative about truth. But I am saying that sometimes I might be wrong. I might think something and I might be wrong. But if I'm wrong, God is gonna straighten me out and, and, and let me know. But So what I'm saying is I don't know everything, but I do know one thing, that if, if, that if I'm gracious, then I'm representing my God properly like he says I'm to represent him. All right, so uh, grace makes God desirable. That's why it's mentioned before truth. Here's the second reason. Grace makes truth bearable. You know, we can take anything if we know we're loved. I know you can. You've had some, you've had some hard times. You've had some hard things spoken. You've had some difficult things going on. When you know your love, though, it, it really just kind of softens that blow and you can take almost anything as long as you know your love because love makes things bearable. Truth without grace is mean and grace without truth is meaningless because grace and truth are, are, are like medicine, you know, like, a, like a medical team. You know, grace is the anesthesia where God comes in and he ministers to you and he relaxes you and he gets you prepared and then truth comes along and, 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 and does surgery. So grace always comes first and then comes truth. Now, let me give you a perfect example of this medical team of grace and truth working like God has designed it to work with grace coming first followed by truth. 
All right, here it is. This is in John 8, and this is the story of the woman that is caught in adultery. And I'm just gonna tell it to you, all right? You remember, Jesus is out in the public and the Pharisees come dragging up a poor woman that has been caught in the very act of adultery. And they drag her in before Jesus and they say, Jesus, this woman has been caught in the very act of adultery and the law of Moses says that she should be killed. So what are you gonna do with this? And Jesus just stoops down and he begins to doodle on the ground. And as he's doodling on the ground, I'm just kind of imagining that they're probably trying to, you know, they're moving in and trying to see what he's doodling on the ground. And, he, and, 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 and as he finishes his, his, his uh, information that he's scratching in the ground, um, he, begin, he stands up and, and he looks at him and he says, um, all right, the one of you that is without sin, you can be the first one to cast a stone. And all of a sudden, the crowd begins to disperse. And the poor woman that was caught in adultery is the only one standing there. And Jesus looks at her. Now, I've had people say, what do you think he wrote? You know, I don't, I really don't know, but I have a, you know, I have an idea. I think that he, most likely he was writing their sins. That's what he, he was probably doodling their sins. He was listing the sins of the people standing around there. And I don't know, he might've been real personal. He might've been, her name is Mary and drew an arrow over here to this Pharisee, you know, <laughs> said uh, the money is under the rock and drew it to that Pharisee. You know, I, I don't know, but, but whatever it was that he was writing when he stood up and said, all right, the first one without sin can cast a stone. They all just began to disperse. It became a ghost town and the woman is left standing there and Jesus looks at the woman and says, um, where are your accusers? Uh, uh, no one condemns you? And she said, no one, Lord. And then he looks at her and he says, well, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, this is what you call grace and truth. Because did Jesus tell her the truth? Yeah, he told her the truth. He said, you're a sinner. And what you've been doing is sin. So go and sin no more. He told her the truth, but he told her the truth in the context of grace. I mean, Jesus wasn't mean to her. He wasn't harsh to her. He wasn't condemning to her. He wasn't unloving. He saved her life. She was gonna be stoned to death. Those Pharisees were gonna kill her. Jesus actually saved her life. And so that's our God. God tells us the truth but he does so with mercy, from the mercy seat and not from the law. You know, God could destroy us with the truth, right? I know you remember the line, Jack Nicholson, from A Few Good Men, you can't handle the truth. Well, the fact is, we can't handle the truth just by itself. <laughs> let, me, let, me give you, let me give you some, some uh, results from a, a relationship research. This was kind of shocking to me. This, this research was done in 2019 by uh, uh, Marriage Today, and it was reported, and it, it's really kind of shocking what it says. Listen to this. As it relates to the success and happiness of your relationship, the Institute found that, ki listen to this, that kindness in your spouse is more important than compatibility. Isn't that kind of shocking? Having a kind partner is more important than any list of compatibility points that can be discovered by contemporary testing. And it goes on to say that they are sharing this truth with the online dating sites and encouraging them to change their questionnaires to emphasize character over compatibility. They also found, no, you like this. This, is, this will be good information for you, all right? They also found that in a conversation, that the conversation never rises above the level of the first three minutes. Is this shocking? The first three minutes of a conversation determines the height of the conversation. There's nothing wrong with disagreeing in marriage if you can resolve it and you're not mean about it. When you start a confrontation in marriage, you don't start with telling them, I'm going to tell you what, I'm so sick of you. I have onehourdivorce.com pulled up on my phone, and if this conversation doesn't go well, I'm going to hit enter. 
No, that doesn't work. Here's what does work according to, these, to, the, to the marriage institute. Start the conversation with grace, like, I need to talk to you about something serious. Now, has anybody ever heard that line and you, and you and didn't go, oh, I want to talk to you about something serious. All right, but listen to what comes next. But first, I want you to know that I'm committed to our marriage and I'm glad I married you. We're on the same team and I believe everything's going to work out. So when you start out with love, the conversation has a much higher probability of being successful because the conversation never arise, rises above the first three minutes because we simply, and this is so true, we simply can't take truth without grace. We can't handle that kind of honesty and that kind of confrontation unless we know that we are loved. Think about it. When you first meet your boyfriend or your girlfriend, your, 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 your other, you are naturally gracious. You go over the top to be gracious, right? You're sweet as, sweet as honey. You're kind as you can be. Oh, honey, let me open that door for you. Yes, all right, beautiful, yeah, come on in. Is it too hot for you in here? Because we can turn this down. Oh, it's cool? Okay, I'll turn this vent off for you. Let's get that right. Oh, yeah, all right, good. Hey, where would you like to go? I mean, anywhere, just name it, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're just so kind and we're so gracious. We just go overboard. But, of course, the longer we're in relationship with someone, the more that natural graciousness and kindness begins to erode and sooner or later we find ourselves really no longer very gracious anymore and, and, and we just become too blatantly truthful about things and we just blast and blast. So grace makes truth bearable. Third reason why grace is mentioned first before truth Grace makes the word understandable. Let me mention this to you about, about interpretive keys. Every, every work that, whether it's a work of science or a work of uh, uh, fiction or a work of writing or if it's uh, uh, the Bible, what, what, when you have a great work, it, it always has a, a key that if you understand the key, you can interpret what the work is telling you about. If you don't have the key, you misunderstand many times what is actually being said in, in this work. When it comes to the Bible, let me give you the interpretive key of the Bible. When it comes to the Bible, whenever you read anything in the Bible, the key to understanding it is grace. Without grace, the Bible is a very dangerous book. The Bible has been used for a millennium to do some very bad things in the name of God. There have been much hurt and much destruction done because somebody said that the Bible says, and they did these horrible things because they didn't understand that the key to understanding the Bible is you have to read everything through the lens of grace. Let me give you an example in Matthew chapter nine. This is, what, this is, this is, this is an event that happened in Jesus' life. Matthew nine, verse nine. And Jesus passed on from there and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now, it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick... Now listen to what, this is what Jesus challenges them with here. But go and learn what this means. Jesus looks up and says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call righteous, but sinners to repentance. So he said, when you can understand that, 
then you can understand why I eat with sinners and why I relate to sinners. So what does that mean? Well, it just simply means Jesus is saying to them, look, don't give me stuff. I, I, I don't require a sacrifice. I didn't come here so you could give me stuff to sacrifice to me. I want you to love those people right there. That's exactly what that was talking about. So without grace, the Bible is a very dangerous book, but when you understand grace, the Bible actually comes alive. All right, now, let me give you five characteristics of grace quickly, all right? Five characteristics of grace. Number one, grace gives me something that I don't deserve. As a matter of fact, that's really what it means, that God gives me something that I don't deserve. Let me give you a, a, a passage, Ephesians chapter two. This is, most of you know this, these verses, at least a couple of them. Ephesians two, listen to what it says. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you're sa you've been saved. And he raises us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, According to what Paul says in Ephesians, the only condition for grace is faith. For by grace, you are saved through faith. And that faith doesn't even belong to you. It was given to you by God and not of anything you did so that nobody can boast about it. So there are only two things you can do with grace. You can accept grace or you can reject grace, but you certainly can't deserve grace. You can't be proud and walk in grace because grace is 100% about Jesus and 0% about, about us. And nothing that we get from God is ever earned. The problem with we Christians many of the times is that we're not humble because uh, we somehow have the opinion that we're a little bit better than other people and somehow we have earned this position with God and that somehow God is in our life because of something that we did. But, but, but that's not true at all. The only, thing, the only reason God's in our life is because of what he did, not of something that we did. You remember when I was talking about the church just a few moments ago about patting, they were patting themselves on the back because they didn't do this and they didn't do that. And, you know, they didn't drink, they didn't choke, smoke, they didn't chew, they didn't want run with women to do. I mean, everything, everything in, in, in the message was about what they didn't do. As if somehow you could build a perch for yourself by what you didn't do so that you could be, you know, elevated and you could deserve what you get. But no matter what you get from God, the fact is we don't deserve any of what we get from God because it is God's grace. We are saved by the grace of God. And if we got what we deserved, we would go to hell because, well, let me just run down the Roman road real quick. Romans 3.10, there's, behold, there's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 5.8, but God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the, with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's how we get saved. Not one ounce. For the wages of sin is death. What are wages? Wages are what we get paid for what we do, right? So what we earn for what we do the sin in our life, we earn death. That's what we deserve. But the gift of God, what is a gift? A gift is something that I give you, right? If I had this in my hand and I said, you know, I'd like to give you this gift. And I went to give it to you and you tried to reach it. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, got any money? 
uh, $5. Would it, would it be a gift? No, you would have bought it. Uh, here, have it. No, uh, wait, uh, my house needs to be cleaned. Do you think you could take care of that for me? Uh, would it be a gift? No, it, you, you would have worked for it. The only way it can be a gift is if I just give it to you and it's a gift. So Paul says that salvation is a gift from God and it is the grace of God that gives us that gift. And I'm sure you've heard the acrostic, the old acrostic for the word grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. And so the reason that people go to hell is not because they're not good people. The reason people go to hell is because, because they don't receive God's gift that he gives them. God wants to give us forgiveness of our sins, the gift of eternal life, the gift of himself. You might say, man, I've never done anything good in my life. Well, join the club. None of us have ever done anything good enough to deserve to go to heaven when we die. You got to come the way you are. That's why we have to have a savior because none of us are good enough on our own. So, Grace gives us something that we don't deserve. Here's the second characteristic of grace. Grace suffers for the sake of another. Let me give you this out of 1 Peter. I, this is one I really wish you could see, but I'll try to read it where you can, where you can stay with me. This is, this is really about redemptive love. Um, and, and you'll understand, I, I, I want to talk about it, uh, redemptive love, but, but let's look at what grace does. Grace suffers for the sake of another. 1 Peter 2. This is at the end of 1 Peter 2. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. So this is saying Jesus suffered, and he left that example, and we're going to have to suffer. That's what he's saying. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. For, listen, for you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. This is saying because of Jesus' righteous behavior, because Jesus suffered for us, and when he was abused and when he was reviled and when he, sh he had every right to lash out and destroy people that were uh, uh, abusing him and hurting him and coming against him, he suffered for our sake. And because he did that, we who were staggering around like a bunch of lost sheep in the wilderness found our way back to our shepherd and the overseer of our soul. That's what grace does. It brings us back. Now, in the very next chapter, that was the last verse of the second chapter. The first verse of the third chapter tells us, it, 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 here, it says, all right, here's your first illustration of, 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 of how to redeem each other like Jesus did. Verse one, wives, now, this is going to sound like something out of Ephesians, but this is not the same thing as Ephesians. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. Then in verse 7, and it, it talks about that between verse 1 and 7 about how to do that. Verse 7, husbands, likewise, Dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. 
knowing that you were called to do this, that you may inherit a blessing. So the fact is, while we were in our sins, Jesus was loving us. This is called redemptive love, by the way. Love that redeems. You, you don't respond in kind to another person's behavior. He says, he says here, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but in turn, when you're reviled or evil, bless them. I mean, my sins put Jesus on the cross. Think about it. My sins put Jesus on the cross. I was his enemy. While I was against him, he was for me. He was doing this for me when I was doing everything I could against him because he doesn't treat people the way they treat him. And these verses say that just as his righteous behavior led us back to our, the shepherd and overseer of our soul, we've been called to do that very same thing. And notice the, that he uses marriage as the first illustration of how we redeem each other. In marriage, if you treat each other just according to the way you deserve, you are going to have a terrible marriage. There has to be a redeemer in the marriage. And I know some of you, this may surprise you when I say this, but I haven't always been the wonderful husband that I am now. There have been times where Tanya had to really redeem me. As a matter of fact, Lots of times she's had to redeem me. In the younger days of our marriage, we've been married 44 years, in the younger days of our marriage, I was very uh, self-centered. Um, I loved athletics. I spent a lot of time on a ball field and on a golf course. And Tanya stayed at home with our children and didn't even have an automobile. I mean, I'm, I'm really even ashamed to talk about this now at the moment. I feel a lot of shame at the moment just even talking about this. But she was at home. I had to go to work, and, and I had, we had one automobile. We were poor. had one automobile, and uh, I had to take it to work, and she had to stay home with Justin and Amy. They were little things, two years old, three, you know, and, and, and up. And, and she had to, if she wanted to go anywhere, she had to get them in a little red wagon, seriously, and pull them, walk, and pull them in the little wagon down the road to go anywhere that she needed to go. And I, after I got off from work, a lot of times, I'd just go straight to the golf course or to the ball field, and she would be at home all day with the children. She'd be suffered all day with the kids. <laughs> Y'all don't kill me. I feel already terrible about it myself, but... But this is the thing. Now, I know that somehow she had to communicate to me that this was not a good thing. Somehow she had to be conveying that. I, don't, I just don't see how she could have just not ever said anything to me about this. Like, hey, I, you know, quit doing that. I'm home all day with the kids. She didn't do any of that. Now, I'm sure she said something, but it wasn't severe enough for me to just you know, get all bent up about it. But what she evidently had to do was she had to just pray and say, God, look, I'm, I love my husband. I want our marriage to be good, so I don't think I'm going to be able to change him. So God, you just, you change me. You do something in me. Make this where I'm strong enough and I have enough peace and I have enough grace so that I can, I can live and I can do and I can take care of these kids and, and, and I won't run my husband out of my life by this. That's evidently what she had to do. Now, that's redemptive love right there. And by now, you know, uh, she won. <laughs> Yeah, uh, things have totally changed in our life. That's why I'm saying every marriage has to have a redeemer. And you can't live on a point system. Let, let me just read you what I wrote because the time's getting away and I'll jabber about it. It's not a point system. Listen to this. It's not like you've earned three points today, so I'm gonna give you three points of love. You are minus 14 for the day, so this is gonna be a bad day. 
You can't live life on a point system. Get rid of the point system. Jesus doesn't use a point system with you, and you don't use a point system with other people. The verse says, Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. You cannot disassociate your relationship with people from your relationship with God. Matthew 25, the parable of the sheep and goat, sheep and goats. Jesus says, if you've done it to the least of one of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. If you haven't, if you haven't done it to the least of one of these, then you haven't done it for me. What that says is Jesus takes it personal how we treat other people. In other words, we can't disassociate the way we treat other people and God. We can't say, all right, we love God, but we're not going to love other people. We're gracious toward God, and we want God gracious toward us, but we're not going to be gracious toward other people. Let me tell you what I've learned about being gracious after 44 years of marriage. Here it is. If Tanya has a bad week, by the way, as she gets a little older, she's a lot more aggressive. I just want to throw that in. If Tanya has a bad week and she's aggravated and has a bad attitude, what I need to do is just be gracious. It's going to be over soon, and it'll be over sooner if I'm gracious rather than if I'm angry. People have bad days. People go through stuff. And if you're always in everybody's face and it always a point system and everybody has to treat you right and if they don't treat you right, you're not going to treat them right, that's not graciousness. That's not like Jesus. Now, I'm talk not talking about being abused. If you're being abused, now that's a whole other story. But in marriage, we all suffer some. All of us suffer. If we get in bed and I snore half the night, Tanya suffers. If Tanya cooks something... Uh, <laughs> with ingredients that I don't like, mixing it all together, thinking it's going to taste better all together than it would. Oh, I suffer, you know? We all suffer in marriage. And so, we, in other words, every marriage, we have to be redemptive. We have to be gracious in our marriage. And that's what God expects us to be. All right, give me, let me give you the third one, and I'm going to move on quickly now. Grace accepts those I would otherwise avoid. You know, those people the people that are not like us, the people that don't like us, the people that do things that are different from us, they reject us. Maybe they're even unkind to us. In the Gospel of Luke, here's what, 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 what Jesus said. And, I'm, I, and I'm, I'm gonna put a word in here, and if it was on the screen, you could see it, but Luke 6, let me read it, verse 32. But if you love those who love you, what credit, and, I'm, and I put the word grace, if you love people who love you, what grace is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Verse 33, and if you do good to those who do good to you, what grace is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what grace is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back but love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High. For he, God, is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Did you know that about your God, that he just loves everybody? Now, some people are going to go to hell when they die, but they're not going to go to hell without God loving them. Because he loves them anyway. They, they were unthankful and they were evil, the verse says, but God was still kind to them. God's kind to people, but God, uh, people who, who don't even like him, he's kind to everybody. And therefore, we're to be merciful and gracious as our Father is merciful and gracious because God doesn't use the point system with us and I don't have to earn his love. He's just a loving God. And he says, that's the way I want you to be. Just like that. All right, number four characteristic. Grace creates a safe environment for those who are weak or hurting. If you're weak or hurting, the safest place to, for you to be is with Jesus. This is Jesus quoting 
from Isaiah the prophet. This is in Matthew 12, verse 18. Behold, my servant whom I've chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will declare justice to the nations. He will not fight or shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. Finally, he will cause justice to be victorious and in his name will be the hope of all the world. And, and, then, and, and then here comes a, a vulnerable person as an example. But next verse, then one was brought to him who was demon possessed and blind and mute. Now, is there anybody more vulnerable than a demon possessed person who's not even in control of themselves and they're blind and they're mute? Is there anybody more vulnerable than that? But notice what Jesus did. And he healed him so that the blind and the mute man both spoke and saw. Jesus is your safe place. Your weaknesses, your frailties are not safe with people who are not gracious. When you're hurting, you want to be around someone who is, who is kind. Well, you say, what is kind? Inclined to be nice, you know, uh, harmless to others. You, you're around somebody. I mean, when, when you're hurting and when, when, when things are, have turned bad in your life, you, you want to be around somebody that you're not afraid they're going to turn you inside out and upside down because they know what's going on. No, no, it, the verse said, a candle is, that is barely flickering is safe in the hands of Jesus. A, 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 a reed that is crushed to the point that it's almost snapped in two is safe in the hands of Jesus. God's grace means that you can go into his presence because he will never take advantage of any weakness in your life. You are safe in the presence of Jesus because of his grace. Five, grace extends forgiveness and pursues peace and reconciliation whether it's deserved or not. Whether somebody deserves it or not, if you're a gracious person, you're going to extend forgiveness and pursue peace. And I know everything can't always be worked out, but, but you, you, can, you can pursue peace and reconciliation in the fact that uh, you're not going to be able to jihad with this person. That's all right. But you're not going to be an enemy. You're not going to be angry and, 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 and violent against this person. Luke 6. Therefore, be merciful just as your father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you'll be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put in your, into your bosom for with the same measure that you use, it'll be measured back to you. The context here is forgiveness, judgmentalism, and mercy. Jesus said, I'll give you as much grace as you'll give away. I want you to be merciful. I don't want you to judge. I don't want you to condemn. I'm going to give you as much as you will give away. So the more you give it away, the more I'm going to give you. Merciful means you don't give people what they deserve. God is merciful. He doesn't give us what we deserve. God is gracious. Grace gives you something that you don't deserve. God is gracious because he gives us something that we don't deserve. We don't go to hell when we die because of the mercy of God. That's what we deserve. God's mercy keeps us from getting what we deserve. We go to heaven when we die because of God's grace, because grace gives us something that we don't deserve, and we don't deserve heaven, but we go there because God is gracious. So this week, if you're struggling, when, you, when you're struggling, you can go right into the presence of God because God understands. And God says, look, my greatest virtue is my grace. So when it comes to you, you can be bold. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be, fright, be frightened that God's gonna put the hammer on you and that he's just, you know, I think some people have the image of God that he's got the Bible in one hand or the scroll of law in one hand and he's got a baseball bat in the other hand and he's walking around heaven saying, just do that one more time. Like somehow he's trying to find a reason to condemn us and to, and, and to hurt us. But no, he's, he's a God of grace. We're called Christians because Christian means little Christ. And, and, and I know this is staggering to think about, but you know, we, in many people's lives, we may be 
the only Jesus that they're ever going to see. And the way we love them and the way we treat them is how they're going to perceive that God feels about them. And so God says to us, look, I want you to be like me. I want you to be gracious. I want you to live this kind of life because that's the way people will know me and be attracted to me. One of the assets that we have as God's children, and it's really the only asset that we have, is that our life is to be lived in such a way that when people see it, they are attracted to Jesus. It, it, it calls them, it beckons them. And if we're, you know, howling wolves and demanding, you know, people and we're angry and we're hostile and we're, 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 we're bitter and we're full of judgment and we're full of strife, and we have no grace and we have no mercy in our lives, they're not gonna be attracted to Jesus. They're gonna say, like I said, when I was 14 years old, if that's the way God is, I don't know where I wanna go. I don't know, leave me out of this deal, you know? And that's a terrible thought to think that anybody would be like that. So anyway, that's our mission. Jesus, God is gracious, uh, number one. All right, let's bow our heads, would you please? <laughs>